And I want to give a special introduction uh, to uh, my daughter, uh, Professor uh, Claire Gleitman, uh, one of my two children who inspired uh, my work on language acquisition uh, since her earliest judgments of grammaticality at the age of three uh, and four, uh, and who has continued now uh, to teach me how to understand poetry. Uh, and Claire is sitting here um, uh, partly as a technical assistant because I have much trouble seeing now. In fact, I can't hardly see at all. And when I get lost uh, among these slides, she's going to rescue uh, you and me uh, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, put us uh, back on track. So, so thank you, Claire. Okay, so, uh, so I decided uh, to talk uh, 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 tonight uh, on the uh, uh, topic uh, of uh, the evolution uh, of uh, human language, uh, which is, uh, uh, is, is a topic which is very much uh, 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 in the forefront today uh, uh, in the popular press, uh, and in the scientific community over a range of disciplines, linguists, to some extent, uh, psychologists, uh, anthropologists, uh, and, 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 and others have seemed to have a tremendous interest in this topic, and there are hundreds and hundreds of papers and scores of um, uh, journals and... Uh, and um, uh, conferences, uh, all about uh, uh, the evolution of language. And I find this a little bit paradoxical uh, because uh, we, we really don't have any hard evidence uh, about the evolution of language. After all, language leaves no trace uh, in the fossil record, uh, and a few rumors to the contrary uh, there aren't even any claims that on Earth today there are uh, some languages which are more primitive than others. They all seem to be uh, 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 much the same at their core. So where would we get information about uh, evidence about uh, the evolution of language? Uh, but uh, the lack of evidence uh, doesn't stop people from speculating on this topic, perhaps uh, uh, to the contrary. Uh, so I'm going to try to look at uh, 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 where this, uh, uh, in, at least what I think uh, uh, is a good way to look, uh, a reasonable way to look at the evolution uh, uh, of language from what we can discern from indirect evidence. So. There were really two main approaches. The huge majority approach uh, is that language uh, uh, evolved as a kind of uh, cultural artifact, maybe the same way or analogous to the way uh, weapons evolved over uh, 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 the history, uh, the 200,000 years or so of human history. So first there were the stone axes and the arrowheads and so forth and so on. And we've evolved all the way to atomic bombs, if you want to call that progress. So, uh, and it's as the needs uh, or uh, interests of, of civilization became more complex. So the story goes, there became a more and more need for communication in complex societies. So little by little, by increments over eons, uh, human language develops. Maybe it starts with animal cries, uh, and then it gets a little further with some concrete nouns, and, and on and on, and finally to uh, a sentence. So you'll recognize that point of view, uh, certainly the dominant one as far as I can see from reading. Uh, but there's a minority view, very much the minority, but just as venerable, 
uh, and you can see uh, uh, traces of uh, belief in this view, uh, uh, going all the way back to Herodot Herodotus, a uh, great anthropologist historian, uh, is an early source. Uh, uh, Herodotus, you know, went to Egypt uh, and tells the story of uh, some Egyptian kings who wanted to know what was the original language. So they did an interesting experiment. Uh, <clears throat> the kings had two children, two infants, set apart uh, in a um, isolated cabin with only shepherds to take care of their everyday needs. But no one was to speak to them on pain of death. Uh, and the shepherds were to wait, and they did, for two years until the infant mewlings were finished, uh, and then to listen uh, to which language these children would then begin to speak. Okay, so here you see a sort of belief that, that, um, that language comes as original equipment with being uh, a human being. So whether you had, a, if you had if Egyptian was around, or Phrygian, or some other language, you would learn that. But if nothing was around, you would invent a language of the same character or related character to the received uh, languages. So one might call this a discontinuity theory, because uh, uh, it, it isn't talking about a slow, incremental evolution uh, over eons of something like our modern languages. Uh, but they come into existence suddenly, on this view, uh, as a consequence, as a, whatever genetic mutations were required uh, to make Homo sapiens into Homo sapiens sapiens brought language along for the ride. Just as, for instance, we don't have to teach dogs uh, uh, the difference between a whimper and a growl and a, a bark, uh, it comes as part of the program for running the dogs. So they know how to produce them and they know how to understand them uh, as a part of being a dog. So that's this other story. Uh, and it's the one I'd like to pursue uh, uh, for the next hour or so. Okay. Uh, so although maybe that Herodotus Egyptian experiment never got done, uh, uh, there certainly are a couple of good ideas here which maybe uh, uh, can be pursued. The first is that we ought to be looking at young children. They're the targets, uh, the usual targets of language learning, uh, and there's clear evidence that they're the, they are the best learners uh, of human languages. Uh, but secondly, we want a case where they're uncontaminated uh, by input from some received language. So the uh, interest would be in finding how language develops in a modern uh, young brain uh, without any input. So that's what we're looking for. So are there such cases? There certainly are such cases uh, of a few kinds uh, uh, that I'll be talking about. Uh, but the obvious one, this has been known about for a hundred years uh, or more, uh, it is the case of deaf children who are born into hearing, speaking families, but cannot learn the language uh, of their parents because they can't hear it, and cannot learn sign language from their signing parents, if they have them, because these hearing parents don't know anything about sign language, they don't know any sign language. So here are these children of perfectly normal mentality, uh, and they're sitting in their houses, uh, and they're not receiving any linguistic input at all for a few, idea, for a few years. Uh, a widespread practice, much more so in the past, but by no means unusual even today, uh, is that the parents are counseled very often, uh, not to gesture with their children, uh, not on pain of death this time, uh, but on pain of 
their children not being motivated to learn to lip read, uh, 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 and uh, vocalize uh, when they become older. So at the age of three or four or five, uh, they, they often go to a deaf school. But there is this period uh, in between. Uh, and my then graduate students uh, uh, and I uh, uh, first heard about these children. Um, help, help. There you go. Uh, and there is a um, first graduate student. She hasn't changed much, so you'll recognize her. Amazing, right? Uh, this is Su Susan Golden Meadow uh, at age 18 or 30 or 50 or whatever. Uh, and um, I, another then graduate student, uh, uh, Heidi Feldman, who you'll see when this video clip starts. Uh, and so we had heard about these isolated children. That was very exciting. And we thought, well, maybe we can find out uh, what is it, what did they do? Uh, yes, we've heard that they uh, gesture, uh, but are the gestures uh, language-like? Are they like English? Uh, and in, in what sense is there some structure to the system? Uh, so we began to go uh, and see. Uh, and I'm going to begin here by showing you uh, one of these early video clips. It's about 45 years old. I'm the little boy is about 45 years old today. Uh, so you're seeing, a, you'll see a black and white grainy um, uh, uh, video clip. Uh, and um, you will see Heidi Feldman uh, with this then three-year-old child. Uh, and she's extremely enthusiastic and cooing a lot because, first of all, because as you'll see, he's very cute. But second, because I think you'll be able to see, she sees her dissertation topic evolving <laughs> in front of her eyes. Right? So, so just a hint. Uh, about what's going on, although it's very I iconic, you'll be able to see it. They have brought with them, Heidi and Susan, a picture book, uh, and at the point when this clip starts, it's open to a picture of a snow shovel. Uh, and what the child is uttering, saying, signing, uh, is he points to the snow shovel, uh, and then he gravely says, I shovel. I put on my boots, I go outside when it snows, and I shovel me. Uh, so here it is. Shovel, shovel. shovel. Uh, 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 Yes, yeah. outside, and it's snowing. Oh, and it's snowing. Oh, we got a shovel. Right. Oh, I see. Well, that was stunning uh, to us. I think it's, it's stunning. Uh, and, uh, well, in some quarters, some linguistic quarters, you might say, that's it, there's language. Okay, that's it, except for some output constraints, uh, uh, which come along later. But uh, we uh, wanted to ask whether we could find some uh, uh, evidence for structures, structure in the system, not just maybe, not just a mimicking. After all, there's meaning in paintings, there's meaning in dance. Uh, is there something particularly linguistic uh, about what's happening in this child? Uh, and a half a dozen other children that we were able to study uh, uh, in this uh, situation. Uh, so we settled on looking uh, at a core product, a, a, a core property uh, that one finds one way or another uh, in every received language. Uh, and that is that every verb essentially comes with its own little mini grammar uh, as a function of what that verb means. Okay, uh, so here are a few simple examples. Uh, if you are talking about an act that is self-caused, 
doesn't require an ag outside agent like smiling or snoring or walking or something like that, then all there is to a, a predication containing this verb uh, is the verb itself and its single participant, the doer of the action. So verbs like this tend to surface a few warts and exceptions aside in natural languages as intransitive verbs. Uh, that is, the boy smiles. But other verbs uh, require or license both a doer uh, and, and what it gets done to. So if you look at a verb like um, shovel, okay, uh, it's possible to describe the shoveler, uh, but also that which gets shoveled, namely the snow. So verbs like that can surface intransitive verbs, so two nouns, two noun phrases, uh, and a verb. Uh, and finally, there are verbs that involve transfer. I mean, this isn't all the kinds of verbs that there are, but as far as argument number is concerned, these are the main types that one sees from language to language. Whoops. I, I can't, if I try to go backwards, I'll really screw up, so re think you're on that previous page, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, you have these different grammars of different verbs depending on the meaning that they, so it arises uh, from the meaning uh, 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 that these verbs express. Uh, so we thought to ask, uh, is that distinction made uh, by these isolated little children? They don't even have anybody else to converse with. Uh, we, can we find this structure? Uh, well, there is an enormous glitch in trying to do so when you're looking at very young children, because as those of you who have or have seen a child know, uh, at these very young ages, children speak one word at a time, and then a little later, two words at a time, then three words at a time before they take off and, uh, and become uh, uh, real speakers of the language. So in the, the age that we're looking at these children, they're only producing two-word sentences, two-word two uh, sign sequences. Uh, so it would seem that we can't ask the question we wanted to ask because they all, all the, everything will look like, everything will look like a noun and a verb, uh, uh, and that's that. But wait, uh, there's a little more structure here in known languages that we might exploit uh, 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 to work our way back into that question, even though there is this brevity constraint in early child speech. And that is, it's also true uh, of natural language uh, that words and phrases get omitted uh, under many circumstances. So for instance, uh, if your uh, co-worker was going out for lunch, he might uh, call out to you, what, what does it say here? Uh, going to lunch now. No subject. I could. Uh, and you might answer, get me some pizza. Now in the imperatives of English, the subjects uh, tri uh, uh, usually, almost always, uh, om omitted. Then you could look at some languages, like the Romance languages, uh, where even in declarative sentence, uh, you rarely hear the subject overtly expressed, uh, uh, but rather it's inferred. And of course, little children's language, in which they only speak two or three words at a time. So notice what's happened here uh, is, yes, there have been om omissions uh, of some of the noun phrases that seem logically required uh, for those verbs, given their meaning, uh, but something is omitted and systematically, preferentially, uh, in human language, it's the subject of the sentence that is the victim uh, of this kind of uh, omission when it happens. So now we're going to use that omission uh, uh, to look and ask whether in these deaf two-word two speakers, two-word signers, uh, we find we can find evidence of the same thing, that subjects of the sentence are treated differently from other uh, 
arguments of verbs and therefore ought to be subject to, uh, sorry to keep using subject two different ways, uh, <coughs> ought to be systematically deleted uh, in order to get into this two-word format, which is all the children uh, uh, can do. So we'll be looking, so we'll be saying, well, the more arguments a verb naturally requires, the more of them have to be left out in the two-word sentences. And it ought to be the subject which is systematically deleted. And that's what I'm going to show you that analysis now. OK, so here, uh, uh, what we're seeing is our seven, uh, uh, six or seven subjects here. Uh, for one subject, there aren't enough data to look at. We reconstruct what the child is saying I, by, by, looking, by its iconicity, as in the clip that I showed you, uh, and ask what happens uh, when a verb like uh, here, what's being, what's being expressed is something like Mickey uh, walks, okay? Something like that. Uh, and uh, what appears in the sign sequencing uh, is both of the required items. So to read this graph, if you look all the way to the right where the upward facing arrow is, you'll see our prediction uh, for what should happen, what should be expressed for the intransitive sentence in this language. Uh, and since the child has two spaces, he ought to be expressing both of them, the noun, and the one noun that's required, uh, uh, and the verb. So we expect the children to be able to do this, and uh, indeed, they can, and they systematically do. But things get interesting as soon as we turn to the uh, transitive sentence, uh, because now there are three logically required linguistic entities, the subject, the object, and the verb itself. So if, one, if there isn't any particular structure to how this is done in this self-invented uh, language of isolates, uh, we can now make a simple prediction. Uh, everyone, the, all, each of those three things should be there two-thirds of the time and missing the other third of the time. That's a quantitative theory now, okay? Uh, but if you look at the children, okay, so you see that prediction on the right, uh, and what you see in the children is that this prediction is falsified uh, because it's not... Oh, the verb and the other arguments are there more than they should be, uh, and the subject of the sentence is diminished in the proportion of time that it is overtly expressed. Uh, and finally, we get to the uh, ditransitive, or the, the, the where now there are four required element, the verb, and three noun phrase arguments. So the prediction now on the right uh, is that uh, each one of them will be, will appear in only 50% of the actual utterances. Uh, and again, this is uh, falsified by the data, which showed that they, all the rest of them occur more than 50% of the time, and the uh, appearance, the, the uh, subject argument is almost never there. It's descending, all right? So this looks just like the language, the two-word two, the two stage of the language of the children next door who are learning English from their speaking, hearing uh, parents. Uh, so not only does this, what these children do not only is it expressive, uh, but uh, it um, uh, embodies uh, some of the core structure that we find uh, in the received languages uh, uh, in children of a similar age. So again, there are many people who would say, most of them being linguists, well, that's it, that's language. And now it's got the structure. 
subjects are different from objects. There's this mapping between arguments and uh, number of noun phrases and so forth and so on. So maybe we're well done, but not quite. Okay. Where is this? Okay. Uh, there are a couple of more steps to be taken here uh, because uh, maybe that's the core uh, of language uh, in, in some pretty important senses. Uh, but you know when language is spoken or signed uh, by more than one person, when there's a communicative environment, a couple of more things have to happen. For one thing, there has to be some kind of consensus in how this is done. So it can't be that one person is saying snow and the other person is saying snow. It can't be that one person is speaking English and the other person is speaking French. It just won't work. Uh, they've got to come to some kind of communal agreement uh, at, uh, as to how this language is going to work. So in order now uh, to... Uh, 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 and then, uh, then there's a further step, which I'll ignore for the moment, and I'll, I'll get back to it later. So it would be of great interest if we could look at these... Uh, um, self-generated systems, uh, but in a situation where there was, uh, uh, where there was communication, where there was more than one of these children at a time uh, when they were communicating with each other. Uh, and today we have several cases. This happens quite frequently in many places in time. Uh, uh, and we're beginning to have a lot of evidence about what these systems look like and how they evolve uh, over the life of a community this time, not just over the life uh, of, of one little child. So the greatest case I'll get is a case that's been looked at uh, 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 most carefully is Nicaraguan Sign Language, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. But I first want to say that from this point on, I'm drawing, going to draw on the work from many, many uh, laboratories. I'll mention all of the people who did the work uh, as we go along, but this is not my work, but the work of, of many of these people uh, whose names you see here and, and who I'll allude to again. So let me start with Nicar Nicaraguan Sign Language. Uh, and this is work from Anne Sengas and many, many collaborators uh, uh, who I will mention. And uh, uh, Nicaraguan Sign Language, spoken in the area of Managua, uh, uh, is a very interesting case because we can almost tell you to the minute when this language began. Because in the, about the 1970s, the government opened a school for these isolated deaf children. For, you know, they're very frequent. 90% of deaf children are born into hearing uh, uh, families. There are a lot of children uh, in this condition. And the government opened a school for these children. Various things were taught, practical things. Perhaps there was even an attempt to teach them Spanish, but that didn't work any better than it did uh, at home, since they can't hear. Uh, and, uh, uh, but at any rate, the children were brought together on a bus uh, 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 to a meeting place, a school. Uh, in, in, in the, there were no uh, uh, signers teaching them, just regulation uh, uh, teachers uh, of, of goodwill. So these children came from many uh, homes. Uh, and of course, all of them being like David and the other children I showed you, they all brought with them their little home sign uh, uh, systems. Uh, and, uh, but an interesting thing happened because it was a long bus ride. Uh, and there's also fallow time in schools, as many of you may have noticed. Uh, and during all of these times, of course, the children began to gesture to each other. Okay. Uh, so what you're seeing schematized here 
is what's called the first cohort, are these children who first came in the 70s uh, to arbitrarily divided to 10-year periods now. Uh, so the children come together, uh, they ride on the bus, they gesture to each other, uh, and um, uh, 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 this little community uh, builds, so they're learning from each other and uh, presumably coming to some consensus. And then later on, uh, as more children reach the age of four, they're fed into this system, let's call those the second cohort, from about the mid-80s. Uh, uh, and uh, they're also bringing their home sign uh, into the situation, but they're also learning whatever happened uh, to this emerging language uh, in the first 10 years, and so forth. Okay, so just give you a hint uh, of the kinds of things that you'll see here. Uh, so here's one of many interesting studies. You see one of the problems of what consensus uh, begins to has to look like uh, in a languages of this sort. So ta look at the upper left-hand quadrant here. Uh, uh, and what you're seeing uh, is a uh, girl uh, uh, pointing uh, uh, to the boy on the right, right? Uh, but it's also true, that's from the perspective of you, the viewer, but it's also the case that from the perspective of the girl, she's pointing to the boy on her left. Okay, left, right, left, right, depends on your take, whether you take the point of view of looking at, in at the scene from the outside, or you take this perspective of the character who's doing the speaking. You're gonna say either left or right. Well, that's intolerable, right? Okay, and this kind of complexity is particularly important in a sign language because a sign language uh, is talking about movement and space, uh, in movement and in space, so it's sort of the nexus of one of the, of complexity uh, in this kind of language. So what happens here? Uh, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, four children from the first cohort and four children from the second cohort. Uh, so in the first cohort, uh, I forget which is the red and which is the blue. I know. Uh, the red is the, um, the signer who is signing scenes of this sort, taking the viewpoint of the character in the scene. Uh, and the blue is signers who adopt, adopted the outside viewpoint. Okay? Uh, and we see that in the first cohort, it goes both ways. So the first person here prefers... Uh, the, to take the viewpoint of the character, the second person prefers the opposite, the third and the fourth person go back and forth, okay? You can imagine the confusion of reference uh, to the world uh, that would occur if a language stayed that way. Essentially, you can't tell the difference between the subjects and the objects. You can't tell these core properties. But look what happens in the second cohort. Language has completely settled down. It's made a choice. Uh, and now everybody is doing it the same way. As it happens, uh, the point of view of the character in the story has been adopted. So I want to show you uh, an interesting case. Again, I'm going to show you a video clip uh, of an informative situation uh, in which we have a first cohort and a second cohort uh, member of this community uh, signing to each other in a quite a controlled environment. So this is a very well-known uh, procedure uh, in which one tries to elicit spatial language uh, from a speaker of a language or a signer of a language. Uh, so the subjects are divided. They either take the role of, uh, let us say, what's called the director of the matcher. Each of them is seated in front of a set of photographs, the identical set of photographs, 
photographs, but there's a barrier between them, so they can't see each other's photographs. And the director chooses one of the photographs at random and holds it uh, in front of himself and describes it. Uh, and the matcher has to listen to the description or see it over the barrier if it's a signing situation uh, and pick up his identical card. So it's telling us something about the production of spatial language uh, and its comprehension uh, in the community. Okay. So uh, what you're going to see now is a first cohort signer and a second cohort signer uh, in a situation like this. Uh, and um, I'll tell you a little of what's happening. This uh, uh, was a video clip collected by Anne Sengas, and you're also going to hear her voice over. And you're also going to see captions, because this isn't so easy to understand anymore since the language has evolved further. So there's an aunt, a woman about 35 years old, uh, and she is a first cohort um, user of Nicaraguan Sign Language. So early, so she was a home signer and early in the development of this language. Uh, and the second person is her nephew, a boy who's about 14 years old, and he's in the second cohort. And what you'll see in the video uh, is that uh, he describes a scene to her, uh, and picks up one of the cards, describes it, and she's supposed to hold up the same scene, which she gaily does, but then he says to her, uh, he signs to her, you, you picked up the wrong card. And she says, oh, God, this is so complicated. How did they do it? Explain it to me, and so forth, and so on. And he reluctantly, but finally, tries to explain to her how to use spatial language in, they've both been using this language exclusively since they were four years old. But here's a difference in the early evolution of the language uh, and its later developments. Okay, so just to give you a better look at what's on those pictures, they're very simple. Uh, it's a man placed in some way, spatially, with respect to a tree, both toys. Okay, uh, and here is the clip. There's a tree on this side and a man facing forward holding a stick. And they pick them up. Great. Look, look here. Yours has a tree on the left. It's supposed to be over here on the right side, see? It should map to the picture. Yours is over on the other side. Oh, I get it. Is it clear now? Okay, so those ones I messed up before. They're so picky and confusing. So I'm supposed to sign it, the tree here, and then the man on this side facing this way, stick in hand. I just look, simple. The picture's right there. I just sign it like I see it. It's automatic. I don't know what to tell you. It's different for me. It's direct, it's automatic. Just make sure your signs line up with the picture, okay? What do you mean line up? Suppose you had a tree here and a man here next to the tree, and you're looking at it from over there, signing it. You wouldn't sign tree here. It doesn't line up right. You'd put it over here where it lines up. Perfect. Then on the left, you line up whatever goes on that side. If it were a tree like this, and then you line the man up, and you show which way he's looking. That's it. Easy. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, she can tell the difference between the pictures as well as he, he can. I mean, she, can per she perceives the same thing. This is not a Warfian discussion here. <laughs> she perceives the same thing. But she cannot express this complicated spatial language. Can't express it, can't uh, 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 comprehend it. So, this is again about consensus, but it's also about the sort of final complex uh, uh, abstract devices uh, that a language uh, develops. We're not talking about eons here. Uh, we're talking about 30 years in the development of this language. Then now we're about 200 or 300 speakers of it altogether. 
Uh, okay. All right. Uh, but at this point, this complex morphological machinery is going to be developed. You'll hear more about this if you come to the presidential symposium tomorrow, uh, where you'll hear Ted here, see Ted Sapala, uh, who will be talking about similar developments in the history of American Sign Language, which is older. It's about 100 years older, uh, and where complex uh, devices. Uh, we can't, don't have that language minute by minute uh, in its development as we do for Nicaraguan Sign Language. But there's, uh, Ted has written a wonderful book called uh, uh, ASL uh, Archaeology, where he has found the old sources, old pictures, old statements, uh, 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 and so forth, and reconstructed what the signs looked like uh, in early stages of this language and how they change. And I, I won't much talk about this, with this is, uh, but they keep showing the same evolution. So things start out with something very particular. So here, what's being talked about is the future, but one day, uh, one day from now, two days from now, three days from now, I know Ted is laughing at me, but something like that. Uh, but as the language evolves, instead of enumerating how many days ahead, there comes to be a single sign, uh, which is essentially the plural inflection uh, in this language. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to turn now to spoken language, because I think it probably is going through some of your heads that, well, that's all very well for this iconic language, and it, uh, iconic based language, like sign languages are, but how about spoken languages? Uh, is there any reason to believe that spoken languages evolve uh, in the same way and on similar time courses uh, to what we were, a were able to see here uh, in the sign language. So I'm looking now at the case of a, of, um, a Papua New Guinea uh, a language called Takpisin. Uh, uh, the name obviously comes from Talk Pigeon, that is, it began as a pigeon language, uh, which you can now see is just like early stages of Nicaraguan sign language, or any sign language. Uh, and again, I'll just take a quick look at what the future, over the history of this language studied by uh, Gillian Sankoff, by the way, what the evolution of that language looked like, which again, as in the case of ASL, we have records uh, uh, from observers, from users, still pictures, uh, uh, and, uh, and written commentary about the language over about 100 years of its history. So take a look at the future, how future is talked about uh, in Tuck Peace. Well, let me tell you a little bit about um, this kind of language. This pigeon, pigeons develop very often in what are called plantation economies. Uh, so on Papua New Guinea, about 800 different languages are spoke, it's spoken. It's the most diverse linguistic community in a very little space, comparatively, uh, uh, in the world today. It's about 800 different languages. Uh, but there comes a time of year uh, when crops are to be picked uh, on the plantation, and people funnel in uh, uh, to this plantation, uh, and they stay there for a few weeks, they pick the crops, they earn some money, they go home and speak their own language. But they all speak different languages. It wouldn't do much good to learn the next language because it'd still be 799 that you don't understand. <laughs> so what happens in these communities is that a little lingua franca or pigeon uh, uh, language develops usually based on the language of the plantation owner or the foreman uh, uh, during the picking season, in this case, English, uh, and a little language is made by the adults. It's nobody's native language. It's just a 
what you do for a few weeks. Uh, uh, so if you, the, uh, uh, if you want to express the future in this language, in its early stages, there is a word that you can use, and it is by and by. Obviously, from English, by and by, right? Uh, so uh, here, by and by, go long house in the earliest stages. Now, people start to use this. They become a sort of fluent uh, in using it, but still, no native speakers. Uh, and now what happens uh, is that the future tense snuggles up close to the verb where uh, time is talked about. So this is change. Uh, so it's me by my go long house. Uh, but not too much happens. Uh, but then a funny thing happens. Some of the people don't go home. They stay and they get married. But they don't speak the same language. So the only way they have of communicating uh, is in this pigeon. So the only input to their children is this tiny little input. And now, flash. OK, in a flash of evolutionary time, the language changes. OK, and so what you see, two, two things happen. OK, uh, again, the semantics is kind of bleached out. So it isn't any particular amount of time but just the future, uh, and it's squeezed up phonologically into a very short form, so it's uh, a me go home. And for all these speakers know, nobody remembers by and by anymore, okay? It's just the future inflection. So that is 100 years of history. Uh, and now, Tukpisan is one of the three official languages of Papua New Guinea. So there's, it, it's a language now. Well, you may think that's a little quaint. Good, we did it with the spoken language now, but that's sort of cute, by and by, and all that. So here's an abbreviated history of English. English. Same thing, it's had a thousand years. Uh, and you easily see the future. Again, what happens? You get a perfectly ordinary word, and it's commandeered to play this role, and it becomes obligatory, and it expresses the future, and it gets squeezed up phonologically uh, and expresses the abstract idea of futurity. OK, well, this is the last piece of data that I will now show you. Uh, to return to the general theme, because I think it's particularly revealing of what's going on here. This is another case, uh, and it's a case uh, of um, deaf parents, who you'll see in the green bars to the right, and those deaf parents were not exposed to American Sign Language uh, until quite late in life. They were adolescent or post-adolescent when they first learned American Sign Language, okay? Although they were deaf, they were not exposed to that language, okay? So as you say, little children are the big movers. And so when adults learn a language, you know about your grandparents or yourselves, as second language learners never get really good. Uh, and here again, we're talking about spatial language where Sign language are very complicated. Uh, and uh, on the y-axis, what, what you're, you're seeing the progress. Uh, the, the, how good are they uh, in producing uh, grammatical uh, spatial expressions in American Sign Language? And you see the parents are terrible. Uh, they speak broken ASL, OK? Um, that's that, that that's all they can do. And the uh, leftmost uh, bar, you're seeing uh, seven, eight, nine-year-old speakers of SASL 
who learn the language at their parents' knee. In other words, they're deaf children of deaf parents, of deaf American Sign Language users. And as you see, they're way better, okay? They're nearly up to adult uh, competence by the age of seven, eight, or nine. And the crucial case uh, is the red bar. And this is the child of these two green people. There's several of these because it's just one child, but there are obviously many children they've looked at uh, in this way. So here is this child uh, of these broken uh, sign language users. Uh, and what does the child look like? He does not look like a compromise between the parents, not at all. He looks like people he looks like people of his age uh, who uh, have been using American Sign Language since birth. So in other words, in other words, so the claim here, and this is the general claim, what I've been trying to say, uh, is that children, whatever the input, no input, partial input, fragmentary input, disordered input, the children are programmed in some way uh, to devise a language of an antecedently well-specified type. Uh, now you can go back to the second or third slide and think, uh, translate this into, maybe think of these green parents as Neanderthals. The suggestion I'm making to you is it doesn't matter what the Neanderthal language looked like because it would have been wiped out. It gets wiped out. It gets wiped out in the five, the two to seven-year-old uh, normally endowed child who creates a particular kind of language in relative indifferent to the particular to particulars or lack of any input because that's what we do uh, uh, as, as, as people, okay? And it's worked out over 50 or 100 years in the life of a community because grandparents have to talk, be able to talk to grandchildren. So five or seven years in the life of a child, maybe 100 years in the life of a language, but a, a nanosecond uh, of evolutionary history, language will emerge because uh, it's our thing. So let me just summarize what I think is nature's recipe uh, for language evolution. Take two children. <laughs> Mix well. Continue to add and blend in these ingredients. Uh, allow them all to simmer together for 50 or 100 years uh, in a linguistic melting pot. Uh, and a new language will arise, rivaling in systematicity, expressive power, uh, and precision of the received languages uh, of the world. Oh, thank you very much.